education and childcare. So I um, have the good fortune to look after everything early years, uh, including kindergarten in our district, um, as well as our new childcare facilities that are happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the uh, some of the programs that you can access uh, throughout this spring before kindergarten starts, and then sort of what the beginning of kindergarten looks like, and then I'll be turning it over to someone else from the school district. So I'm just going to share my screen. There, I'm thinking everyone can see my um, screen now. So there's a couple of different opportunities for families in our school district that you may or may not know about. And one is our Strong Start Centers. So on the school district webpage under schools, and then Strong Start Early Learning Center. Just waiting for that to come up there. This has information about our eight Strong Start centers across the school district. The schools that they're in are listed on the left hand, or sorry, the right hand side, along with the hours that they're open. And it is a drop in program for parents or caregivers and their child up to age five to attend together. And because it's drop in, you can come for an hour or you can come and stay for the full three hours. And it really gives um, parents and children a chance to get used to the school environment. Often the Strong Starts get to visit the gym or the library. Parents get to know what washrooms are like in the school and a little bit about the shape of the day. So if you are able to and haven't yet, uh, it's really easy. You can register online or uh, the Strong Start facilitators have a paper copy of the registration available at the centers for you. Next up, this one is under families and registration. I know you're all um, looking forward to maybe a little bit anxiously coming to school for kindergarten. So yeah, under, the under the registration tab on the right hand side is coming to kindergarten and there's a coming to kindergarten yeah, yeah. website. I need the pen. Yes. Just letting that load up. And I actually wanted to share something that's at the bottom of this page, first of all is a countdown to kindergarten. So right now we are hosting a Ready, Set, Learn events across our school district. Uh, we just had one last week and our next one is coming up um, in April. So you can click on here and you will see the posters for the events. There's also one um, in Ladysmith in May as well. Those are also drop-ins and the ones this spring are happening at different parks. So it's an outdoor opportunity and they are called pizza and play. So we'll have a pizza lunch for you um, if you come to those as well. And now what you're really wanting to know about is kindergarten. So on this coming to kindergarten page, there's a great video that was done with kindergarten students and a teacher at Fairview Elementary School to show you about uh, registering and uh, what to expect about kindergarten. This information here around registration. And then I wanted to talk about two events that happen. One will be in May or June, and then the second is at the beginning of the school year. So you will be getting an invitation from your school, um, probably from the principal or the secretary, but maybe the kindergarten teachers, to attend a Welcome to Kindergarten event. And that will be held sometime in May or June. And it's an opportunity uh, to meet the kindergarten teachers at the school, the principal, do some activities. And there is a play pack of filled of books and activities for you to do with your child at home. After that, in September, we have a gradual entry start to the kindergarten year. The first day of school is on a Tuesday. And it's always one hour and it's only for kids going into grades one to seven. So starting on the Wednesday of that first week is when gradual entry for kindergarten starts. It looks different in the different schools. 
There is an opportunity for the parents or caregivers and the child to come and meet with the teacher. And sometimes that's done individual family with the teacher. And sometimes it's done in small groups of children with their parents coming. And then there are a series of days where the kids come in small groups for shortened periods of time. Sometimes it might work up to being the full group, but maybe only for a half day. So that lasts the first week. And the first full day of kindergarten is the Wednesday of the second week of school. Where needed, you can always have more adjustments to your entry routine. You just need to be talking, communicating with the school principal and or the kindergarten teacher once you know who your child's teacher is. I'm now going to turn it over to Amy to talk a little bit about the typical day in kindergarten, and then I'll come back on with some information about some frequently asked questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Diane. Uh, my name is Amy Blow and I work with Diane with the school district and my role is that I'm a district learning coordinator. Um, I have many parts to my job, but I am very fortunate that most of my job is with the early years. So I get to work with all my kindergarten colleagues and Strong Start and everything early years. So um, I'm also a kindergarten teacher in the school district. So just here sharing a bit about the typical day in kindergarten. And of course, kindergarten it, um, varies each teacher, each school, there's a different context, different community, but a few pieces that I'll highlight that can be um, rather consistent in the kindergarten program is using a play based program. Um, we have two wonderful ministry documents and you may have heard of or hopefully we'll hear soon is called the BC Early Learning Framework or the and or the Play Today Handbook and that is really encouraging teachers to reflect on their practices to think about um, inclusive environments. Oh thank you so much Diane. All the links are at the bottom of the Coming to Kindergarten site um, and so there are um, documents as well for families specifically the let's play one for families is one that we use for our ready set learn but you can see the play today on the right and the bc early learning framework so we're really fortunate in bc that our ministry encourages us to use play-based practices because it's a great way to create inclusive spaces for all children um, and diane if you don't mind scrolling back up to the typical day piece i'll speak to that perfect um, so most kindergarten classrooms start with a morning routine. It might be a soft, gentle start to the morning called soft start um, or morning tables with that activities to put out for children to engage in. Um, some kindergarten classrooms like to start with everyone coming to the carpet and doing a bit of a story or a check in. Um, lots of play based literacy and numeracy as well. Um, with the whole group pieces, like I was mentioning with the soft start in the morning or coming together at the carpet, um, there will be opportunities for songs and stories and poems and physical movement of dancing or doing actions along with literacy to include the physical learning along with the, um, the songs and the stories that they're doing as well. Uh, kindergarten also includes a period of time that might be called center time, choice time, or exploration. There's different names for it, but is a period of time where the children have a lot of choice and get to build their agency about where they would like to play in the classroom, who would they like to play with, how can their interests come forward through um, this time as well. And it's amazing how many opportunities I've had as a kindergarten teacher by listening and watching and observing children during their free play center time to go, oh, you're really interested in trains. Why don't we bring this back to the group and end up doing an inquiry around trains or whatever the child's interested in. I've done space before, lemonade stands. There's so much that can emerge. Um, and then the weather permitting when it's really, really rainy, we do get inside recess days, but um, always dress for the weather. That's what I tell my families, um, because uh, there's there will be a little recess and a big recess where children get to go outside and play. Typically for most schools in September, um, the kindergarten students have a penny or they have a little band to help 
um, the duties at the playground know that um, these are the new kindergarten children and they may be limited in the beginning of the year to a specific area where they play like the primary playground. Um, also, when they come to kindergarten, there'll be time for snack, there'll be time for lunch. And so just thinking about different containers or a lunch kit that your child can manage, or if you need any support, please don't ever hesitate to ask. Um, there will be a variety of different types of lunches and food in the classroom, I'm sure. And um, I think I mentioned a little bit about doing the inquiry and play-based learning for the center time, but again, this can come into science and social studies activities very easily. And um, often in the afternoon, there's this nice, softer, quieter time, Take a, kind of like taking a break, but doing some quieter activities in the afternoon, especially in September, the children are so tired <laughs> it's a big day for them they get really tired so it's nice to just offer some different activities puzzles lego reading a book alongside a friend and of course reading looks different in kindergarten than it does in the other grades so it might be retelling the story through a picture or a book that is a favorite read aloud and they memorized and they're sharing it together and again, in the kindergarten day, there will be different periods of time where children get to go to different areas of the school, as Diane was speaking about, um, with Strong Start. Sometimes you get to go to the gym or you get to go to the library and um, there's a music room as well. And so with Strong Start, you might get an opportunity to visit these areas before even coming to kindergarten. Um, and no worries if you don't, because you'll get an opportunity to do so in kindergarten. Diane, I think I will pass it back to you for the frequently asked questions. Thank you, and feel free to jump in with any of these, Amy. Sure. So there's lots of questions that parents have about kindergarten, especially if it's your first child coming into school. So we do have some frequently asked questions here. So one, one of the sections is around washrooms. Some kindergarten classrooms have their own washroom. Some, it's there's one nearby in the hallway and the teacher will do up a plan for the students. If that's the case, sometimes they go out with a partner or they have some sort of a system. Um, we do look for some independence in toileting, but if your child needs support with that, there will be a chance for you to talk through that with the school staff to figure out what's going to work best for supporting your child with that. Uh, recess breaks. Amy mentioned that the kindergartens wear a penny at the beginning of the year and sometimes my experience has been that it can last two or three months. It just depends on the size of the schoolyard, um, sort of the independence of the group of kindergarten children, that sort of thing, but it does readily identify for all the adults outside and even the older kids for helping out that these are our kindergarten children. So if they get turned around on the way to the washroom or find themselves wandering over to a different area of play, people know that they're kindergartners and where they should be coming. Some information here about um, shoes, backpacks, lunch materials. Amy mentioned about, you know, practicing maybe with the lunch kit or the container that your child, if they can operate those independently. And if not, again, that's just a, a conversation with the teacher to help um, to let them know. If your child can manage um, runners, it is a good idea to get the Velcro ones because then they can be fully independent when they're starting a school, um, but we're, we're used to helping kids with their shoes, zipping up their coats, uh, turning sleeves inside out, um, all of those sorts of pieces that happen um, with the children when they come to school. Uh, there's some information about choosing a backpack that's the right size. Um, sometimes it's hard to find smaller ones for kindergarten and their lunches are big and that sort of thing and the backpack can look the same size as the child. But if you could try to find something that's a good, a good fit, that works as well. And then our district does offer busing at some schools. It depends on the distance away from the school um, that you live in, the different areas of town. On the website under the parents part, there is a transportation department area as well and information on there about um, registering for um, the bus system. So I think now I will turn things over to Carrie. Great, thank you. Just before we click to the next page, Diane, I just wanna mention a couple of other little pieces around um, some of the frequently asked questions. 
uh, related to kids who have additional neurodiversities and, and additional uh, mobility needs and things. So um, just one piece around the washrooms is we, we really do mean it that we're happy to help if something is going on for your child and they're not yet independent with toileting. I mean, you know, that is a, a life skill that, of course, we're always wanting to support children towards independence with. But we've had families in the past that were a little bit um, nervous or reluctant to have their child start school if the toileting routine wasn't firmly established. And we are happy to work with you on that. We don't want that to be a barrier to your child coming to school. So, um, you know, certainly um, if it's a developmental need or if it's related to a physical mobility difficulty or something like that, just please, you know, let us know and we'll and we'll work through it with you for sure. Uh, the, the folks that support you through early intervention, if your child's involved with the early intervention program, um, most of those therapists are also our school age therapists. And so there's actually a pretty seamless transition between those two programs. And we get lots of support around that, too. Um, in terms of the lunches, I just wanted to mention this has come up a, a few times in the last little while that, um, you know, it can be tricky if you have a child who uh, has some pretty particular needs, wishes, preferences in terms of diet, a fairly restrictive diet. Um, you know, I know it can be quite challenging. Where it's possible to send food for your child that does not need to be heated, that is helpful. We don't have access to microwaves and things in our classrooms. So um, it, it will mean that somebody's going to have to leave the room and, and sort that out. And it's not always possible. Um, but having said that, if the only thing your child will eat is a specific food that's warmed up, again, we will figure it out. We will work with you. Um, but I just wanted people to be a little bit aware that it can be difficult to have heated up leftovers. So thermoses that keep things warm and things like that are, are preferable. Um, and then the last piece I'll comment on is the busing before we switch over to the other page. Um, Diane did mention that there's information about the regular school bus process on that uh, transportation page. Uh, we do have accessible bus routes with our little buses that are more supportive for kiddos who require that, but it is quite limited. It, um, there are only so many routes and places that we can go and still get kids to and from school safely on time. Um, so we do prioritize kids with mobility needs on those accessible routes. Um, having said that, we have a, a number of kids with um, either cognitive disabilities or uh, really profound sensory needs where a regular school bus just isn't going to be the safe or comfortable place for them. Um, so if you think that your child would require the support of an accessible bus, uh, that's something you'll have to talk to the principal at the school about to work through an application process. And we will be setting up those routes. Um, if it is for a purpose other than a um, mobility need, then we may not be able to confirm with you until into the summer whether or not we'll be able to accommodate you on the route, but we do our best to be as supportive as we can. Um, and that is something that I know sometimes kindergarten families will apply not choose to use right away because they want some time to help their child acclimate to school and get settled into routines and things. But um, if you're thinking that at some point you would want to be contemplating the accessible bus, we should have that conversation sooner rather than later because otherwise we'll build the route in a way that it may not be possible down the road. So I just wanted to kind of alert people to, to that piece as well. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to pop over to the other page. Thanks, Diane. I think it's gonna load for us here. There we go. So we just wanted to um, share a little bit of information about the additional services that are available for kiddos who need them at school. So um, one of the pieces is that, uh, you know, we really wanna share as much information as possible before your child comes to school. So Genevieve will be speaking more specifically to our transition processes, but I just wanted to let folks have a bit of a sense of what information is available in on the website for you here as well. So um, if you were to click on, and I don't think we're gonna do it now because it'll take us out of the screen, but if you were to click on that button that says, where are inclusive education services there, it will open you up to a pamphlet that describes our school-based team process processes, where you go for extra information. It'll summarize some of the things that are below on the page here, but it, it does give you a one pager that you can kind of print out and have at the ready. Um, but if we scroll down, I can describe some of those services now. So one piece is around the school age therapy program. So again, if your child is currently part of the early intervention program for speech and language support, occupational therapy, or physiotherapy, um, there is, uh, you don't need to re-refer them to continue those early intervention services when they enter kindergarten. We are able to provide those services up until their sixth birthday in the school environment anyway. So the therapists that your kiddos are 
currently with will help us get them into school. If you have a, a specific uh, need for equipment or we need to do some orientation and mobility work in the school or something that will help us uh, make sure that we're ready, uh, the therapists typically start reaching out about now and doing that work with us. We do walkthroughs of the school and take a look at equipment needs and those types of things. Um, what will be different is uh, when your child reaches age six and they are transitioning from early intervention into the school age therapy program, it does start to look quite different. Uh, we don't have the capacity to, to provide ongoing OT and PT therapeutic services at school. Uh, the, the therapist, once kids reach age six, consult with us around equipment, if there are exercises and things that the school staff can be doing, or if we need to be making sure we're using walkers and, you know, the those kinds of equipment pieces, they help us with that. They help us with lifts and transfer training. Um, so the pieces that keep kids safe and involved at school, if there's seating that can help be more inclusive, we, you know, we work with them around that. But if your child has a need for weekly physical therapy, that is something that would have to happen outside of school. We're not able to provide those services in the school setting. We just don't have enough staffing to allow for that. Um, the other piece that changes is the speech and language part, uh, because the SLPs that are with the school district are not Child Development Center SLPs the way they are with the early intervention program. So when kids get uh, SLP support at school, that is with the SLPs that are part of the school district staff. Um, we do our best to provide services for all of the kids who need it, um, but it is, you know, we, right now um, we're actually struggling with recruitment a little bit. It's really hard to find SLPs island wide, actually, right now, whether we're at school or Island Health or anywhere. Um, so most of the SLPs are supporting four schools each right now. So it does mean that kids with the most complex communication needs will receive a little bit more support than kids whose needs are less impactful. Um, and it might mean that we're doing a bit of a hybrid of some um, things that we're working with the family on that you can practice at home, some things that the classroom teacher or EA can support in the classroom. And then there may be a bank of service from the SLP over the year, um, but we may not be able to provide ongoing weekly service uh, just because our staffing levels are such that we're, we're not able to get everywhere we would really love to be. So. That's a little bit about school age therapy. Um, if your child's not currently receiving those services, but a need emerges as they uh, enter school, then we have a mechanism for referring after school starts as well. Um, the exchange of information is really, really important. Um, it allows us to reach out to the people on your care team and it allows people on your care team to reach out to us. So uh, without that, it, uh, exchange, we don't have a way to uh, ask specific questions about the support or intervention that your child has. We don't have a way to reach out to medical professionals who maybe have some recommendations or some information for us. Um, certainly, you are welcome to share the information with us in whatever form it works for you. So if your preference is to have a conversation with us, or if you have a written assessment report that you'd like to give all or, um, you know, redacted pieces to us, it, it's your information about your child. You can certainly share what you're comfortable with. Um, but if there is somebody you'd like us to have some conversation with or invite to a meeting, uh, we need it written uh, consent for exchange. So that's something else that can be provided when you go online and you do your registration. If you didn't do it at that point, but you'd still like to give it to us, it's something that could be given to the principal at the school at any time, and, and then we can get um, it onto your file. Um, I think from there, I'm going to actually hand us over to Genevieve, who's going to talk about the transition planning tool and, and how that process kind of unfolds. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Genevieve Busby, and I'm one of the uh, coordinators in the inclusion outreach team in the school district. Uh, my background is also occupational therapy. Uh, so like Amy, I do hang out in uh, kindergarten to grade three classroom quite a bit. Um, so transitioning to kindergarten can be stressful for any child. When your child has additional support needs, um, it can be extra stressful. So um, just because your child has not met all of the readiness skills that you would expect when uh, you enter kindergarten, it doesn't mean that they're not uh, welcome to our schools. Uh, we um, want to support them the best we can by offering you a, a wide variety of, of services in the school district. Um, in order for us to plan um, as much as possible for welcoming your child with additional needs. 
um, we have created a, a document called the Kindergarten Transition Planning Tool. So um, this is a tool that is, uh, this is a family driven tool. Um, so it is for families to complete. Uh, you can access it through this website. Um, but also if you're involved with uh, the early intervention team at the Child Development Center, they will likely have a copy when they visit and introduce that tool to you. So you can um, complete it with them or you can take uh, a moment as a family to, to look through uh, the different boxes. Um, or you can contact the school and they will also have copies at the school. So what the tool is, is uh, it just provides um, a lot of uh, really great information for the school team to start their planning early. Um, if you wish uh, to do so, you may request a transition meeting around uh, May or June. Um, for this to happen, you need to contact your school, uh, your your catchment school and talk with uh, the principal for, for them to, um, they may refer you to a case manager or they may speak to you directly. Um, and then they will be able to find a time uh, for your family to come and meet with the school team and discuss um, your concerns and, and wishes um, so that the transition um, happens smoothly. Um, the, the transition tool has various um, areas that you may um, have information about. It doesn't mean that all of the areas will be completed. Some of them might not be applicable for your child. Um, my favorite box is the one at the very top on the left-hand side because it's about strengths and interests. And I always like to emphasize that area because this is the most important information we can get about your child. When, um, when a, a child is struggling um, with his school day, this is the information that we like to have to be able to facilitate um, a return to calm or uh, take some, some moments with the child to share something that we know they're interested about. Um, and then when this happens, it's, it's um, easier for the child to feel safe and, and loved. And, and uh, we just, um, it allows us to create a nice relationship with your child. So the more uh, information we have about preferences and interests and, and what their strengths are, the more we can create um, some activities that they'll feel comfortable doing and they'll enjoy doing. So um, the other um, areas are medical needs and if, if there's some safety concerns, um, sensory preferences, uh, physical needs, social emotional needs, um, equipment needs, that kind of information. Another area I like to emphasize is communication. Um, because you have already worked with um, a team of of professionals and and probably develop a special way to communicate with a child that has minimal language it's really important to have that information and be as consistent as possible with the way that they're used to sharing information or communicate their needs it might be by taking you by the hand but it might also be by using some pictures or a communication device um, real photographs sometimes are used before uh, picture symbols. So the more we're consistent with the way that we present information to a child that has minimal language, the the more we're gonna the more we're gonna decrease the amount of frustration and and um, and stress in in the child. So that is also an area that I like to to emphasize. And um, the other one is um, regulation, which which, which can be. Um, included in the sensory preferences, but it's how, if, if your child do get, get upset because um, this kindergarten is such a different environment, there, there are more people around and there's more transitions. So if your child um, in the inclusion um, outreach team, we like to see behavior as, communi as um, communication. So when a child is um, showing some behavior, 
what are they trying to communicate us to us and what can we use what do they use at home or what did they use at preschool or daycare to help them calm themselves so having some have they learned some special breathing techniques or do they use a, a particular sensory tool or a fidget tool and the more we have the more information we have about their profile and as early as possible, the more we can plan for uh, to have those tools and to um, have a, a successful transition when they come into kindergarten. Um, so that pretty much uh, sums up the kindergarten transition planning tool. Um, and what I um, sometimes at the transition meeting, um, if the uh, kindergarten transition planning tool has not been completed, a team, uh, a school-based team member will have a copy and it's a really nice way to, to structure the meeting um, and, and make sure that we cover all the areas that we, uh, we would like information about. So um, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, yeah, just one add one little piece to that and that is that um, I'm sure you, you were able to hear in the way Genevieve described that that the tool is intended to start the conversation not to be a, an exhaustive snapshot of, of your child's needs our our goal is definitely to be in conversation and to work with you and to sit at the table and learn everything we can um, from you and with you about your child so um, the boxes are little on there on purpose because we just want you to give us a bullet or two to start the conversation really what we would like to use those for is to invite us to all sit together at the table and kind of work through things for sure and um, definitely those meetings at school are really key we definitely want um, families to reach out and, and invite themselves for a tour and a meeting um, it is important to call ahead and set a time schools can be really really busy and we have had occasions where, um, you know, folks bundle up their little person and get all the way over to the school with a little bit of window of time in the afternoon and then nobody's available to to talk with them. And so um, please call ahead before you go. And then that way we can make sure that we're ready and that we have the people that we need at the table um, available to, to sit down and, and talk about things. And um, sometimes those meetings work better at times of day that are a little bit quieter. So particularly if you're wanting to bring your child through for a tour and they're somebody who's overwhelmed by lots of sensory uh, input or noisy, busy places, um, we can absolutely arrange for those um, visits to happen at quieter times of day for sure. Yeah, so with that, Cheryl, I think we're ready for questions and things. If folks have anything that they're wondering about and would like to pop on, um, the school district team will, will stay. We're here for as long as you need us tonight to answer your questions and things. Feel free to pop a question in the chat or to pop on screen and just ask. Hi, just to clarify. Um, so my son is autistic and he needs support when it comes to going in the washroom. Um, would he be able to have that support? Like a person would be like an older person would be there to like guide him in there or how would that work? Yeah, most often that would be an education assistant would be assigned to assist with that. Um, for our kiddos who uh, are fairly independent but just need steering in the right direction, then somebody can do yeah. that. If he actually needs somebody to physically go in and help him with clothing and those types of things, we can arrange for that as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. And I can add a small tidbit there on behalf of kindergarten teachers, a large part of our day is asking children, hmm, it looks like you may need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Do you need to go to the bathroom? Why don't you just go try? I get <laughs> so, that. I get yeah, that. My, my yeah. son, he just recently learned how to um, go to the bathroom. A lot of times he would be like, okay, you know, I have to go to bathroom, bathroom time, or he will act like he needs to go, but he's so distracted by Marble Run or something like Legos. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anybody else with any questions or things this evening? You can also type a question in the chat if you're not comfortable speaking tonight. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering about like EA support, what that looks like at the kindergarten level. Is there one-on-one -on -one ever, or is it always like maybe there's one EA in a classroom or? It's, yeah, it's highly individual. Um, so 
we always strive to provide kids with um, the right amount of support that lets them grow and develop and experience things meaningfully in the classroom um, without overwhelming them and kind of hijacking that independence by having an adult too close by. So our kids who really do require the hand over hand support or co-regulation in order to be safe and successful, we do our best to provide that support. Um, it is difficult to provide uh, enough EA time that everybody who um, might benefit from one-to-one -one, uh, has it all the time. So there are lots of circumstances where it is shared support. Uh, we, we really work hard to provide that support, uh, particularly at the start of kindergarten for kids who need it as they get to know the environment and get to build a relationship with their teachers. Sometimes we can ease some of it off, but um, we, we do our best. Um, but it's it's hard to describe where and how that's implemented without kind of knowing the kids and the environment and how they're responding to the, the classroom setting and things. So. Okay. Thank, yeah. okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm wondering how it, how support works for um, kids who are like my son who's waiting diagnosis and like he needs a lot of support, but, but we're in this like purgatory of, no diagnosis yet is there ways to have ea support uh, and designation for kids like that so designation can only happen where we have a formal assessment report that identifies uh, a child with a specific diagnosis that meets criteria for ministry designation so that is quite a formal process that's um, attached to some specific criteria that we have to go through um, the good news is that we don't uh, provide support on that basis. We What we use the designations for is to help us create the individual education plans, and we have recommendations that can formalize some of the goals and objectives and things for kiddos. But if we can see that they need assistance with something or they would benefit from, um, you know, a little bit of EA time to help navigate their day, um, we make those decisions based on what we observe in the child's behavior and what we learn from you and what we learn from the assessment information you do have. So um, often, actually, we have kids start kindergarten and we don't have the whole story yet. They're little and they just haven't had an opportunity to go through all of those processes yet. So we start with what we know and build the plan that we, we think is the right starting place with you. Um, and then as we learn more, we refine it and add the layers. And for some kids that eventually leads to designation and for others, it doesn't. Um, we do have a, another plan that's called a student learning plan. And so it is for kids who we feel we need specific goals, objectives, strategies, um, you know, identified interventions, um, and they don't meet criteria for a ministry designation, then we would use the student learning plan to help us guide that work while we're either while we're waiting or instead of if that's the, the journey that we're on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add a little piece that it's not only um, children who hold a designation that we would have one of those transition meetings for. So you can reach out to your school principal if you're thinking that your, you know, your child is going to need some extra supports. As we said earlier, the more we know about your child um, ahead of time, the more we can do some planning and have some supports or, you know, those special um, fidgets or, or whatever the case may be, know that we need a, a quiet space or, or that sort of thing. So I'd encourage you to reach out um, to your principal to arrange that as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. We actually, we're seeing that a lot tonight. So maybe I'll, I'll just um, jump in on it too while we wait to see if there are other questions. Um, at this stage, before your child has a classroom teacher, because you're early in the registration process yet, it is the school principal that you're going to want to talk to as your starting point. That is the person who will put you in the right direction to who else you might need to speak to at the school and help you with setting up the transition meeting, help you with tours, that kind of thing. Um, come September, when you have a, a class for your child, that shifts a little bit in that uh, your child's teacher will become your first point of contact for any questions or wonders or um, concerns that you have. Um, if you bring a question to the teacher that the two of you can't work out on your own, then the teacher will refer your child to something called the school-based team. And the school-based team is a place where classroom teachers, uh, principals, vice principals, typically the school counselor and the support teacher at the building um, all sit together and problem solve and, and brainstorm around strategies and interventions and next steps and things. So um, for now, for sure, call the principal. Um, come September, it's the teacher that you're gonna to wanna to start with with your questions. They'll be in the, the best position to move things along for you. 
Thanks, Carrie. I do have a quick question in the chat, and it's about um, my my son is followed by an Island Health SLP. Will he automatically get connected with SLP at school? Uh, so Island Health SLPs meet with the school district SLPs in the spring. Typically, that happens sometime in May, and so they they transition as best they can. Um, and so often our SLPs will encourage, um, you know, they kind of go to the K teachers and talk about who we might need some referrals for, um, but it's not a perfect system, especially with personnel changing and things over the summer. So if it's not an early intervention person that you're working with, then my suggestion would be to alert the classroom teacher pretty early on that you had SLP support from Island Health and they can help facilitate that referral for you. And our kindergarten classes typically are visited by our SLPs pretty early in the year too, and they do some informal screeners and things. So um, we can kind of hit the ground running because it can take some time for that formal rep referral process to work its way through. And so um, SLPs and K teachers talk lots in September usually, and, and they do lots of visits to the classroom as well. Okay, so is that something you'd set up with the principal then? If you um, didn't know who your classroom teacher was early on, would you call the principal early? We probably wouldn't submit those referrals until the fall anyway, um, but you could certainly on the transition tool identify that you had worked with an SLP previously and there is a spot at the top of that tool to actually put the phone number and stuff too. So if you've signed the consent and you've identified the individual, the school team can reach out. Um, also, if you have copies of assessment reports and things from, you know, OT, PT, SLPs, um, behavior interventionists, anybody that you're working with who has helped you put some of the pieces of your, your child's support and intervention together, uh, we really, if you're comfortable sharing that stuff with us, we're really happy to receive it anytime. All those recommendations really help us figure out where we're going and, and how we can help. Thanks, Carrie. I have another question here. Um, if we requested a transition meeting while registering for kindergarten, should we also reach out to the principal or would that be sufficient? I would reach out. Um, I think there's lots going on at schools. And if you registered prior to spring break, um, they may not have kind of caught up to some of those requests yet. And so I think really any time now, I, I agree with Genevieve, May and June are typically when most of those meetings happen. But if you have uh, a child who's particularly complex or you're just feeling really worried about starting in the fall and you want to make sure that we know what we need to know, um, we can meet with you anytime now. If you reach out to the schools, we can start setting up those meetings. Thanks. How are we doing? Yeah. Thanks for monitoring the chat, Cheryl. I have it open, but nothing's popping up on mine. I didn't realize people had been Yeah, they're coming it. through as direct messages. I don't know if it's how we set it up or not, because oh, okay. I don't count very much, but <laughs> it's all good. Does anybody else have any questions? Can I just add on one piece about, um, like Carrie, you're mentioning about signing the consent for release of information. Um, as a kindergarten teacher, that has been so helpful um, because I can read it um, even before gradual entry or even in the, like if I get it in the spring, then I can be starting to read that now and thinking about what the transition in September is looking like and to know like if there are certain supports and things or language or tools that your child is already familiar with, it is so helpful for me to get almost like a proactive start when I'm thinking about my classroom planning for September. So if you're willing to share those, um, it's it's really helpful. And another piece a lot of families don't know is that our um, this, while the teachers come back kind of right at the end to set up their classrooms and officially are there on the first day of school, our principals and vice principals are back usually the third week of August. Um, we do have lots of meetings and things that we pull them out of the building for, but um, they are there and the buildings are open. And, you know, if you have a little one that we, we might not be able to take you right into the classroom, but certainly if you feel like a visit to the school and, you know, kind of orienting to here's the office and the gym and the bathroom and some of those pieces would be um, a benefit to your child before school starts. We're happy to have kids come by for visits before school starts. Um, the other piece that lots of families sometimes do over the summer is just lots of play dates in the schoolyard so that the kids get used to the playground and the property a little bit. Um, if you have a little one who uh, 
likes to run out of the property and onto the road and into the parking lot and places like that, as much practice as you can give them with staying in the safe places on the schoolyard before we receive them in September, that can help too, because it gets pretty exciting when there's 200 people out on the playground. And even when all the kindies are in their pink t-shirts, it's um, it can be hard to kind of keep everybody safe and where they need to be at the beginning. So schoolyards are open all summer. You're more than welcome to go by and, and play on the equipment and get used to that environment for sure ahead of time. Thanks, Carrie. So we have another question here. Um, who monitors and assesses before and after school care in schools? That sounds like a Diane question. <laughs> Hi. So um, we have a number of third party providers that operate before and after school care in um, our schools. All but I think four elementary schools have on site child care. So you have to find out who it is that's at um, the school that your child's going to. And back on the website um, under the families tab, I think it is, there is an area of child care. And so you can click on that and it comes up with each school and it lists who the provider is at that school. Many schools also have um, daycares that pick up from the school and take the children to a different location. Our district is looking at having two pilots next year that um, are run by district staff, but for right now, um, other than one program at Pleasant Valley School, the rest of our um, on-site childcare is done by a third-party provider. Okay, it sounds like the, one of the concerns is that sometimes in the after-school care programs, the staff don't necessarily have the skills they need to meet with kids um, who aren't cookie cutter, as this is saying. Um, and it feels like it might not be inclusive. So I suppose we're looking forward to maybe the school district having some options. Um, and the follow-up is, I guess I'm asking who they answer to and if they need to demonstrate that they are interested in being inclusive to provide um, after school care. Well, all of our third party providers are supposed to be inclusive and to work with families and um, families can also reach out for the supported child development as well if that might be something um, that your child needs. Um, I do speak with our third party providers and often they are also feeling um, sort of left out of uh, knowing enough about the child. Um, and as Carrie was saying earlier, it's up to the parents sort of to share that information. Um, if your child is attending a before and after school care, and you would like those um, people that care for your child to attend an IEP meeting, you know, to know more, to, to be able to use some of the same language or have some of the same plans, then you can invite them and have them um, come along as well. Right. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. That's all the questions in the chat for now. If anybody has anything else. So I know Cheryl was recording this this evening. We will get it up onto our website after we have a chance to um, finish up. And I don't know if the district usually adds some, I don't know, graphics and things to it, I think, but we'll get it, we'll get it up pretty soon. Um, any of us that are on the call tonight are happy to take other questions and things. So, um, you know, I think um, my contact information was on the poster, but we can definitely make sure that um, it's it's available for, for anybody who wanted to reach out. Um, but absolutely, you know, anytime you can be reaching out to your schools now. And um, actually one question we didn't talk about tonight, but it sometimes comes up is the cross boundary question. Um, so we do need all kids to register in their catchment area school as a starting point. Um, if you're contemplating a cross boundary request for another site, you can indicate that when you register. Um, I do need to let you know that that's a really difficult thing to do right now. Our schools are super, super full um, and there is no guarantee that we'll be able to um, place your child in a school other than their catchment. Um, sometimes families, especially families of kids with additional needs, have some pretty particular reasons why that's uh, of concern to them. And so if you feel you have some extenuating circumstances, it should be part of the consideration. Um, again, I can't promise that it'll be possible, but I can certainly promise that any information that you share with us will be given consideration when the decisions are made. So um, I, that would begin again with your um, application to your catchment area school and then just reach out if you have any questions about that and we'll, we'll work through it. 
Okay, we have another couple of questions coming in. So one is, um, how does a child obtain an IEP after a diagnosis? Okay, so um, what happens is we get the family to bring in the diagnostic report to us, the information that um, states the diagnosis. Um, the classroom teacher or support teacher, depending on who receives that information, will bring it to the school-based team. A uh, school-based team has a mechanism where they review the uh, assessment information just to confirm that it meets the ministry criteria. If it does, then we have some paperwork that gets filled out. Um, we get parents to sign on that so that you know that that's what we're up to. It gets submitted to the district level. Um, for some of the uh, categories, for example, if your child uh, meets criteria for chronic health impairment or for autism or for an intensive behavioral need, um, there's a, an additional layer of district screening process that happens where we confirm just those are a little bit more complicated, those categories. So we just kind of do a double check at the district level. Um, and it's one more opportunity to review the recommendations and make sure that we're starting forth on a, a pathway that really um, takes all of the recommendations and the assessment into consideration. Um, and then you'll be invited to the school for an IEP meeting and um, the school team and family sit down and talk about the goals and strategies that you'd like to focus on. And the initial IEP is created. Um, if that happens on a typical school year, like for example, if you already know that your child has a diagnosis and you've provided that information to the school, then probably the signing off paperwork will happen either in June or September. Um, the first IEP will happen around October. And then there's usually an IEP review meeting in about April or May, um, where we kind of reflect on the year and set some intentions for next year. Um, if your child doesn't meet criteria now and that happens at some point over next year or years following, just whenever you receive that assessment report, bring it into the school and we can initiate that process at, at any time. Once a child has a formal designation with an IEP, they are assigned a case manager. So that will either be the inclusion support teacher or the school counselor, depending on which category it is. Um, and then that person becomes your main point of contact in terms of the supports and interventions that your child's receiving and, and how that process is kind of unfolding. Okay, thanks. And there's another question here that's a bit of a follow-up. Um, what kind of support needs will require having an IEP? Well, um, <laughs> so that's a super good question. Um, so it, it definitely isn't a straight line between a diagnosis and a designation. We have lots of kids that have formal diagnoses of things, but they're fairly independent. They navigate the school without a lot of additional support. Um, their teachers making adjustments and accommodations and having universal approaches to activities and things meet their needs and they do beautifully. Um, so if that's the case, then we would not choose to put the child on an IEP. Where we move to an IEP is when a child has a need that cannot be met through those universal um, whole group opportunities in the classroom. We know that there's a greater need for either specific intervention or we need to help them practice specific goals and objectives in order to develop and progress. Um, that's when we would move to an IEP, would be when we have something very individual that we want to support. Um, the IEP will contain not just the goals and strategies that we're practicing with your child, but also a list of the care team that's providing interventions for them. Um, it contains background information and diagnostic, like, you know, dates of di diagnostic reports and things, just so we can keep track of all the information that we have received. Um, and if there's any specific accommodations or specific supports that we're um, using, then those are also included in the IEP. So it's where there's something really individual that we need to track and keep, you know, pay attention to moving forward. Okay, so you just assess it as you go along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes have kids that will be designated for a period of time, and then they, um, you know, develop some independence or what, you know, it, it happens often with chronic health impairments where it's something that resolves over time where the child develops the independence and capacity that they need to, to manage that safely at school. And then sometimes they'll, you know, for a couple of years, we'll de-designate and then often puberty or transition to high school is a time where stuff starts to kind of percolate again and then we'll, we'll re-designate. It, it doesn't happen often. Most kids, when they are designated, whatever's going on uh, for them is something we support over a lengthier period of time. Um, but occasionally it will happen that we do designate and redesignate, and, and um, that's just a conversation we have with you moving forward. Great, thanks, Terry. A couple more questions are popping up. So, um, can a child with extra needs but no diagnosis access a resource room teacher and or an IEP? And are there other options for them as well? So, this parent is saying they're right on the edge of it, 
of a diagnosis, um, but we'll need to reassess in a few years. But no diagnosis is likely over the next few years. So there cannot be an IEP without a diagnosis, but there can be a student learning plan, which is a similar kind of document that looks at goals and strategies and objectives and things. Um, the Ministry of Education prescribes the criteria for IEPs, and so we can only designate where we meet the, the prescribed criteria from the ministry. Um, our support teachers, uh, their, their title these days is inclusion support teachers. We don't have a, a person who's called a resource teacher anymore. We've revisioned the role a little bit and we, we provide all of our support on, on what we call a, a tiered model of support. So tier one is our base universal classroom, um, whole group kinds of, of things that happen in the classroom environment. Tier two are kids who either in the classroom or in a separate spot might have a little bit of small group intervention, or they may have some additional tools that help them navigate the classroom that are more individualized. And then tier three are the highly individualized uh, supports and interventions that we put in place. So those are available for all children, regardless of whether or not they meet a ministry designation or criteria for an IEP. If we observe that something is needed to help a child have a safe and successful experience at school or to be meaningfully included with their peers in the classroom, uh, we do what we can to provide for them. Um, I'm really glad that education has evolved in this direction because it certainly hasn't always been the case. There was definitely a time when, uh, you know, a specific diagnosis or designation resulted in a specific entitlement to certain services or interventions or access to certain specialists. Um, and it could be a real barrier to providing what we needed to for our kids at school. Um, but we really do approach it very differently now. And we try really hard to uh, do it on a needs basis so that kiddos are getting what they need and um, we're wrapping around them as early as we can be. And then it becomes a situation where when we do get the formal diagnosis, um, now we have some more information and extra things that we understand about the child and their needs. And it, it allows us to add some layers to things, but we don't have to wait for that to provide the support. Brilliant. Thank you, Carrie. Um, another question. Does the district offer any specific programs for gifted children that have that are autistic? That's the second time I got asked that question today. Um, so <laughs> Again, this is another aspect that has changed over time. We used to have a gifted and enrichment program in the school district, and it looked like uh, pull out services at the school or even off site services that happened a few times um, through the school year where there were special events for kiddos that were um, identified as having a gifted profile. Um, we don't do it that way anymore. Um, part of it is that we know that kids who are gifted learners aren't just gifted Tuesdays and Thursdays for 30 minutes, that that is who they are all the time when they're with us. And so we want to make sure that we're really um, aware of their needs and wrapping around them and providing opportunities throughout their, their time at school. So where we have a child with a gifted designation, um, we try to be really flexible in the ways that we provide opportunities for them. So some of that may happen in their home classroom. Um, I know you know, learners that have been enrolled in kindergarten or grade one, but they might do their math in the grade three class, or they might go visit their big buddy during science in the grade six class or something like that to get access to um, opportunities that um, stimulate their, their level of understanding of some of the concepts. Um, I've seen kids that are engaged in a little bit of stuff at school and a little bit of stuff in the community. Maybe they help on a farm once a week or have access. I had a little guy in grade four a few years ago who spent some time in a mechanic shop once a week because he was interested in all things mechanical and nobody at school could kind of engage that part of his brain. We didn't know as much about it. So, um, you know, I've seen kids in elementary schools have big buddy conversations with a peer at the high school once a week or an adult outside of school once a week if, if that's an area of passion and interest for them. So we work really hard to be flexible. Um, I've heard it described as a, a child of the school who gets opportunities to engage with different communities of learners, depending on what they're, they're doing. Um, it, it's a little bit tricky, but it's something that we want to do really thoughtfully and we really want um, our kids to feel engaged and connected in their schools. So um, particularly, well, I mean, all kids with additional needs, but particularly kids with gifted needs, it can be a little bit tricky because same age peers isn't necessarily the place where they're going to find the most success. So we need to work really closely with you and have that conversation at school and really do some thoughtful planning. Um, and my experience has been that um, gifted learners also sometimes struggle to have those really authentic connections with other children. And so we want to make sure that we're providing opportunities for those peer connections and, and helping them feel like they're really a part of things at school as well. 
Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. That's all the questions in the chat for now. Oh, no, another one's popped up. <laughs> um, would you have suggestions for a kiddo who has trouble with anxiety and social skills in kindergarten and would really benefit um, from some support at recess? Yeah, I don't know if Amy or Jen, did either of you want to speak to, to this one at all? So this parent is also saying, um, saying that the school told us the parents should provide that support and outside. Yeah, I can speak to that. And then Genevieve, if you want to add in, please do in case I miss anything, because I may um, definitely start that conversation um, with the teacher when you know who your child's teacher is. Um, I know um, I have had students who have had anxiety in the past before, and it might even be something, even the recess playground, who is there um, that you can, because your classroom teacher won't always be the adult that's on duty at the recess playground. Um, so even taking the time to walk the child right to the recess duty supervisor, they know that that adult is there with them, looking out for them and just helping support that transition that way. Um, even we had bus safety one day and going on the bus was a whole new experience. Um, my principal was really great and she helped actually support the child at that point in time and the other child watched what it was like for other children to get on the bus so communication communication start that conversation earlier because there's lots of um, different front loading strategies and experiences that we can provide beforehand or small bits at a time absolutely uh maybe i i would like um, to add maybe just a couple of, of uh, other strategies. Um, often, um, like I was saying before, preferences and establishing a list of preferences is really key because that's what we're going to look at uh, to really make sure that the child can relate to some of their most um, favorite things outside, uh, creating some relationships within the classroom and who do they like to play with at center time and who do they sit with at, um, at snack time and lunch time and making sure that uh, we have more intentional uh, um, kind of matching of friends so that they have someone, uh, often there might be some students that show a little bit more maturity and then they're showing a, a lot of compassion and then having those matching uh, friendships um, can be good in terms of pre-planning, like Amy was saying, and also um, what we call having a play plan and what, what they're gonna play with uh, based on their interests and based on the, those friendships. Uh, having a play plan prior to going into recess or um, especially long recess can be can be uh, long for some students that experience that nervousness uh, when they're they're in an unstructured environment. Um, also, schools are being very creative. Um, some of the things that I've seen uh, can be a, a special helper at recess and having a safety vest and a couple of band-aids in the pocket and there being the you know the first aid assistant and then they can walk in closer proximity to um a duty so an adult on duty but have a special role role to distract them from their nervousness so schools are really good at being creative uh in uh in the inclusion outreach team uh we're there to if if school staff um, are having some difficulties uh, finding some of those strategies, they can contact us and we can uh, we can brainstorm with them and offer some some ideas. Um, so we are a multidisciplinary team. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. We have teachers uh, in our team as well, a counselor, um, a child and youth family support worker. Um, and some, um, also some lies EAs that also can go and help sometimes when the needs are more complex than what we were, uh, what we were anticipating. So um, schools are being very creative, and they have the support in the district to uh, to connect with that will help them strategize and make sure that the students are successful. All students are successful. 
I was just going to add, I can't remember which one of our district staff said, but to, to um, take your child to play at the school and familiarize themselves with the playground, then they can have a couple of special spots that they like to, to play at or go to. And another strategy sometimes used in schools is having a, a big buddy, or sometimes schools have um, students who are um, peer helpers out on the playground, and that can also be something that helps the child too. Um, do you have a question, Karina? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so my daughter is going into kindergarten and she has cerebral palsy, um, but it's quite mild. So she doesn't have too many support needs, but I'm just wondering if just the diagnosis qualifies her for a designation. We would definitely want to um, sit down and review her needs with you, um, but typically kids with diagnosis of cerebral palsy, we will want to designate because we want to make sure that um, staff are aware. And, you know, even if it's around fatigue in the gym, we're needing to be extra careful around stairwells and that kind of thing. We definitely don't want to miss a step and put her in jeopardy at all. So um, okay. And I don't know if her mobility indoors and outdoors is equally independent or if things like pea gravel and school fields with hills on them and things can pose challenges for her. So, um, right. yeah, I, I, it, I think it's super important we talk about it at, at the school and make sure that we're considering all elements of things. Um, okay. It doesn't necessarily require an IEP, but I think it's certainly worth taking a look and making sure that we're paying attention to all the stuff we need to to keep her safe. Right. And then when a child qualifies for a designation, do they, they get extra funding and what does that funding go towards? Yeah. So that's, that's another really good question that we actually usually touched on and we didn't tonight. So um, there are categories of IEPs that uh, qualify for the supplemental services grant, but it's a little, it's very different actually than what it looks like in the, in the preschool world where, um, you know, particularly with a diagnosis of autism, for example, funding comes directly to the family. Um, how it works at school is that we, uh, because we provide services on a needs basis uh, for kids with and without designations, what, what that actually is, is a, a lump supplemental grant that comes. So for every child that's registered in the, in the system, we get per student funding from the ministry. And then they kind of add up all of the kids in the, so there's level one, two, and three funding, depending on the category that the child's designated in. The kind of sum total of all of that goes to the ministry and then a lump supplemental grant comes to the system and we disperse that um, where it's needed. So it's not really a specific bit for an individual child, but it is it's part of the overall pot that goes towards um, our school age therapy services, our counseling services, our school psychologists, the support teachers, education assistants, physical equipment, uh, teaching resources. And so it's part of the overall envelope, but there isn't really a direct line between a designation and an individual bit of funding for a child. Thanks, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the answer. Um, did that answer your question, Karina? Yeah, thank you so much. Brilliant. Are there any last questions? There's nothing in the chat. Um, so a few parents in the chat are just saying how very helpful this has been. And so I want to say a big thank you to Carrie, Diane, Genevieve, and Amy. We really appreciate you coming on board tonight and um, sharing all your valuable information. Um, I've seen a lot of kids transition from the Nanaimo Child Development Center to the school district very successfully, and I know it's through all the hard work and dedication of the school district team. So thank you so much. Well, we're super happy to be here and answer your questions tonight and happy to answer them down the road. So I know almost every year, the two days following all kids, I get lots of calls from families that wish they'd asked something that they hadn't thought of during the event. So feel free to reach out anytime. We're, we're here and we're super happy to to give you any information that can be helpful. Excellent. Well, I think if there's no more questions, then that would be it for tonight. So have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And thanks very much to the team for coming and sharing tonight too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.